Alright, it's been 20 years since this movie came out and I'm pumped to watch it again and remake this poster. This is Scream. The beginning was my favorite part. Wes Craven does this often in movies where he kills off who the audience think the main character is going to be. He does this within the first 20 minutes. Hello? Hello. She gets a call from this creepy, sexy voice on the phone. Some sexy guy. Can you tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. I thought it was an uncredited cameo from Jack Nicholson the whole time. You have to have a favorite in what comes to mind. I thought it was sexy. It has this like twang of Mel Gibson. I like that movie. It was scary. But I know sexy when I see it. I hear it in the general sense. You know, like blind man might see by hearing or something. I don't know. Like Daredevil? <laughs> like Daredevil, yeah. <laughs> Pretty girl, at home by herself. Popping some popcorn with the Jiffy Pop. Love that stuff, by the way. As a matter of fact, I think sales of Jiffy Pop must have rose after this movie came out. He starts talking to her on the phone. He starts getting kind of flirty. Eventually asks, do you have a boyfriend? She giggles and says no. Shit gets real. You listen, you little bitch. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? Yeah, she's not in the mood for this anymore. <laughs> He's like, you don't ask who's there. Like, have you seen horror movies? <laughs> yeah. You've had your fun now, so I think you better just leave or else. Or else what? She says, I do have a boyfriend that was lying. He plays football and he's gonna come here and kick your ass. He's like, oh, I know you have a boyfriend. He's in your backyard, tied up and bleeding. Threatens to kill her boyfriend if she doesn't play his game and she plays the game. So now she runs for her life. Phone in hand, by the way, not calling the cops. And finally, we see the kill. It's such an iconic look, you know what it is. It's still scary. So we wrap up our opening and are introduced by the real main character, Sydney. We'll see another two plays out of the Wes Craven playbook here when we see uh, Johnny Depp's younger brother sneak in through her window, much like in Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, I was home watching television, the, uh, the Exorcist was on. Got me thinking of you. Nice segue? I mean, he was kind of creepy the whole time. I knew he was the bad guy right from the beginning. I don't think I could ever pull that off so smoothly. He had greasy hair. Lately, we're just sort of edited for television. And what made him really bad was his greasy hair did not stay in place. Women hate that. We hate that. That, that just screams evil. Like, she seems like a very goody two shoes. It's gotta take some strength to turn down your boyfriend for sex for what, two years? It's like when their hormones are all going crazy anyway. If you have a girlfriend, then. That strength might be a bit misplaced, but. Eh. So the next night she gets a phone call. It's pretty much a repeat of the night before. Scary night, isn't it? With the murders and all, it's like right out of a horror movie or something. Because there's a legit killer on the loose, and she thinks it's a joke, and she goes, what does she do? She goes out on her porch and picks her nose. And the killer's trying to get through the door, and then gives up, and her boyfriend jumps in through the window. And she sees a cell phone. She's like... <sighs> because only the killer carries a cell phone. Because they want you to think he's the killer, but then that would be too obvious. Why do you have a cell phone? Like, you're trying to make me think he's not the killer. One's like, what were you doing with a cell phone, boy? Then the next day at school, the word is out, and we find out that everybody in this town is a psychopath. <laughs> Sick-minded people that would find that funny, so I guess it's not totally unrealistic. So then we find out the cops cut the boyfriend loose, and he's just absolutely irritated by the lack of sex at this point. Being with a person who's depressed over something for a full year could get a little annoying after a while. She's physically telling you, like, my mother died. Do you not remember this? I'm very confused right now, and he's just like. I think it's time you got over that. Get over I think he even told her it. like it's like get over you gotta get over it. It was a year ago or something like that. It's like mm, that's a little hard. Drama is a vagina closing deal. So the students were caught wearing the killer costume and sent to Henry Winkler's office. Love that principle. Great principle. He's packing the most menacing looking scissors and he is tearing the scene up with it. The scissors! <laughs> he like takes the scissors, he's like you are. Fairness would be to rip your insides out. 
hang you from a tree so we can expose you for the heartless, desensitized little shit that you are. Because we just saw a guy, you know, using a knife as a weapon. And he pulls out this pair of scissors. It's basically just two knives. Remember, your principal loves you, and I want you to be safe. He's even goofing around in his office with one of the masks he's confiscated. Especially when he's just like so jumpy at every mirror. <laughs> But then we see Sydney alone in the bathroom for a moment when she overhears Mean Girls 1996 talking about her. Maybe she's a slut just like her mother. Girls are that mean in high school, especially. Well, girls always hate their best friends. And what if she did it? What if Sydney killed Casey and Steve? Mean girls suck. And I'm a girl, so I know. <laughs> we all suck. So then 26 year old cheerleader and mom pants leave. <laughs> mom pants? <laughs> Then we get this little paranoia moment. I thought to myself, well, the killer's probably a guy, so she has to be safe in the ladies' restroom. Very like, it was like black pants and shoes, and then it was, I mean, like, were we supposed to think it was somebody else until we saw, like, the robe creep down? I'm like. I always imagine girls' bathrooms being cleaner. When she kneels down to check the stalls, I'm thinking she's gonna have to wash her hands twice. Okay, kitties, strap yourselves in for a history lesson. You're about to be taken into a world before Netflix and Redbox. The extinct relic called Blockbuster. Oh yes, that takes me back. VHS is as far as the eye can see. We get a nice little moment of Matthew Lillard and Jamie Kennedy here. Oh! It came up on somebody and he just like did that weird like tongue thing that like was totally shaggy. I don't, I don't even want to do it because I don't know. How do we know you're not the killer? Maybe your movie freaked mind lost its reality button. You ever think of that? You're absolutely right. I'm the first to admit it. If this were a scary movie, I'd be the prime suspect. But then they want you to think it's the boyfriend because it's so obvious. Yeah, I kind of thought he was a villain there at first. Are you telling me that's not a killer? So, to recap, two people are murdered, police issue a citywide curfew, and you figure all these kids want to do is just hunker down, lock all the doors, and try to be safe as possible. Instead, they have the opposite reaction and throw a party. Big house party, parents are out, who knows where. Literally, like, the par all the parents were abducted, like, by aliens, I'm pretty sure. There are authorities present, mind you, but they're putting alcohol in the kids' hands. Do we? did you just give a kid a fucking beer? Underage, son. I'm kidding. <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> Physically giving beer to underage children. You are so fired. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. Don't have sex. Don't get drunk. Like, what, be a virgin? <laughs> then we see Rose McGowan in a death scene, and you kind of expect it's coming. I and mean, we never saw her be a slut because, you know, we never saw her have sex, but I feel like she is the... The, the slut character in a horror movie, you know? We got to see titties! There's definitely, she definitely has a back strap. But it is very difficult to have your nipples look like that, not in a bra. They probably shot some scenes to be sexual without a bra from the front, but let her wear one to like run. So like when you see it from the back, it's all like, so she's not just falling out everywhere. And just like the scene that they're like, hey, I want you to look at her nipples from somewhere. I also love how I had to like hand gesture like this when I was talking about it. I don't know why. That's a good talent. It's just the funniest way to kill someone. Killer can't deal with doors. But, there. but then again, she's blonde, so she never really stood a chance. <laughs> she tries to crawl through the dog door. Like, I think that I would look at the cat door and be like, my hips won't fit through there. But I forget to question it because of the crotch vortex. <laughs> the vortex? The spiral butt. The camera definitely had an eye for the vortex. And sometimes it was even funny because it would like zoom out and you were like, well, I just came from there, like from her ass. It's hypnotic. It's like she went to the store and said, that's the one. I saw the skirt and I was like, I can suck men into my vagina with this. <laughs> but maybe you don't think about your body proportions when you're running for your life. I don't know. <laughs> so the killer shows up and kills the boyfriend. Or not. He's hanging in there. We all go a little mad sometimes. <laughs> no, Billy! Oh, fuck! Surprise, Sydney. I was I was a little shocked that there were two of them. That was clever. 
What's the matter, Sydney? You look like you've seen a ghost. Because that makes so much sense. One guy could be on the phone, the other guy could be doing stuff. But I was not surprised at Billy. Not at all. Even after he got stabbed. So watch a few movies, take a few notes. <laughs> He was fun. I don't think it was really supposed to be that funny, but because like everything he said, I could just see him saying it to Scooby Doo. Like it just made it that much more funny. Your know, mother was fucking my father. She's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me. And like yeah, that's actually a good reason to kill somebody. Like. I don't feel like you can actually justify murdering someone, but... It seems the weakness to any villain is just to get them monologuing. You know, buys them time, gives them more time to fuck up, and then you're out on top. It's it's really super effective. I mean, I, I've watched so much CSI that I was like, yeah, they're gonna see all the remaining glue from the duct tape on him, and they're gonna do all this scientific analysis of what's on your victim's person and be like, yeah, that wasn't it. But like back then, I don't know if they could do that. I don't. So many people know about, well, if you commit a crime, you know, put bags over your shoes, don't touch anything, wear a wetsuit. Obviously their plan didn't work out anyway. If you're gonna kill somebody, cover the whole room in plastic. Pull a Dexter on that. But then Sydney disappears and turns the tables. Are you alone in the house? Bitch! <laughs> when she asked Stu what his reasoning is, he's like, peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. I completely understood that, his motive. And that scream. I thought I'd be so happy to be a virgin. It was a huge success, quite unexpectedly, when it came out. It very much set the standard of 90s horror, especially in their movie posters. If you look at the poster for Scream, they sort of do this lineup of the cast with this ominous backdrop. And they repeat this layout over and over and over in so many posters of the same genre for years. What always made me curious about the poster was how much of an afterthought it is. It's weird that Drew Barrymore is the biggest person on here because she's only in the movie for like not that long. What? One girl's shocked, one girl's bored. Looking at this on the shelf, there's nothing about it to make you want to pick it up and take a closer look. Apparently the villain managed to have a good hair day for this photo shoot. I just missed that about covers. Why couldn't his hair look like that in the movie? It looks like they shot these a year later and used their headshots. Like, I can just see where the pictures of these people were clicked and dragged and photoshopped. The main character is all the way in the back and small. It's kind of boring, really. Courtney is missing her highlights. I don't see anybody screaming, and it says scream! Skeet Holrick has facial hair. Clever, hip, and scary. I but I had to have words tell me that. That's not coming from the picture. Okay, your movie has people in it. That's all I'm getting from this. They also look kind of older, like more their age at the time. The only person expressing any sort of emotion in here is the main person back there. And most of her face is covered. So to reinterpret this poster, my first task was to get the killer in there front and center. Horror films are defined by their killer. When you look at A Nightmare on Elm Street, you see Freddy. In the original Scream poster series, they never put the killer on the cover until about Scream 4. By that point, it was just a little too late. I mean, you can't really pursue that artistically. As a retrospective, I really wanted to get the other characters and get a range of emotion and make it seem like they could all be victims or suspects or seem threatened at the least. When you see the cop on the cover smiling, you're thinking, Oh shit, you can't even trust the cops in this. I wanted to make the main character more front and center. Drew Barrymore's still on there, but she's smaller, and that's more appropriate. You know, when you see the original, you're expecting Drew to be a bigger character, and she's only in it for 10 minutes. I'm sorry, I know she's like still kind of the big star in this, the big name, but uh, I hate ripping people off like that. <laughs> it's, it's misleading. At least this way you still see her, but in this version, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you still think she has a chance. There's almost no color in the original poster, so I wanted to make it look more rich and new, really. This is the first poster like this for this movie, so I wanted to make it noticeable, even for present day. So when I got this done, Whorehound was hosting a convention in Indianapolis, where David Arquette and Jamie Kennedy are both going to attend. So I had to take my poster to them and get their thoughts about it and have them sign it. I love David and everything, especially Riot Rumble and Jamie's stand-up ever since high school. They are both really cool and had nice things to say. They signed it for me and it's hanging on my wall. 
So, I'll be back to remake a poor movie poster for a movie I love. There is a lot of ground to cover. But I'm open to suggestions and feel free to comment below. If you want to see my other work, a uh, link is in the description and um, I'm available for commission. I've always wanted to do stuff like this and you know, uh, do something that's uh, review based and something I could really, uh, that can really push my talents, uh, you know, because this is what I've always wanted to do. So, and until next time, I'm the Poster Boy. Happy Halloween.